So hi everyone, thanks for joining in and watching us today. Um, today I've got Rachel Manns McKinney and she's the author of The Butterfly Effect. So Rachel's actually joined us before as author for the day. So it's great to have you back again, Rachel. Great to be here, thanks for having me. So Rachel's been published in the New York Times, Washington Post, McSweeney's Internet, Tendency and other outlets. And she is the member of four book clubs. She loves to learn about nature and spent four years researching and writing about insects to prepare for writing her book. So thanks for joining us. Um, just wondered if you wanted to start off by telling us a little bit more about the butterfly effect. <clears throat> Absolutely. So the butterfly effect is about a grumpy entomologist. So a woman who studies insects mm. and she's in the middle of doing research for her dissertation when she gets a phone call that her twin brother um, has had an aneurysm and should she, she decides to come home and help take care of him. So over the course of the book, she has to take care of her brother as well as mostly take care of all of the relationships that she's broken over the past uh, decades of her life and try to put the pieces back together. So she has to, uh, has some family drama, some romantic drama, and of course, the that sibling connection. Yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering, have you got a little bit of your book you'd like to share with us by reader? Sure, sure. I'll give you just the first two pages. It gives you a real sense of that grumpy character yeah. as she gets the bad news. What was it to know the birthday of a woman you hated? While she was waiting at the airport terminal, the notification had appeared that morning on Greta's Facebook with the nudge, wish Meg a happy birthday. If Greta had known it was Meg's birthday, would she have scrounged up a little less antipathy last night when hearing her voice on the other end of a long distance phone call? No, probably not. Meg shouldn't get credit for being born. She had been as responsible for that event as Greta was of flying this plane. This plane and the birth canal were both about delivering people somewhere they didn't want to be from someplace much warmer. Meg's voice on the other end of the phone, happy early birthday, Meg, Greta hadn't said, was a rocky sea, too wet and tumbling to get the full story. An aneurysm, Greta processed that much. Danny was alive and asleep. Meg said she would handle it. It was a decision not to trust her, and Greta made that decision. Greta stared out the window on the last leg of her journey, 24 hours ago, she had been knee deep in rainforest mud, watching butterflies circle above her like a living mobile. 24 hours ago, her mind was turning over the problem of how to keep the microscopic markers on butterfly wings in the humidity. It was nothing like tracking monarchs back home in Iowa. Her research focused on the sex lives of glass wing butterflies, or rather what their migratory patterns and reproduction said about global warming. Out of 120,000 described species of Lepidoptera, she had fallen in love with the glass wings, clear scales and distinctive markings. And then that's just a little bit about her nerdy yeah. side, uh, her grumpiness and setting up that relationship um, between her and her brother and her brother's fiance, Meg. Yeah, thanks for reading that. I'm one interested to know, like there's a lot of insects and butterflies in your book. Where does that interest come from for you? So it doesn't come naturally. I would yeah. say before I started writing this book, I wouldn't have really called myself a like a, an insect lover. Mm. Um, but I started to visit the main place where this book is set a lot, uh, Ryman Gardens with my children. Mm. And it's a butterfly conservatory and a huge outdoor um, like flower conservatory as well. Lots of horticulture. And I just started to get really interested thinking, what would it be like to be someone who this was your job and you yeah. got to just be around butterflies and nature all day long. And that led me down a research hole. <laughs> and I started to learn more about um, first, you know, how do insects or how do butterflies really work? You know, I've, I found out a lot about mm. um, things about butterflies I didn't know, but then also just generally that there's so much more to insects than I would have guessed. And it made yeah. me start to like them a lot more mm. so that's definitely an underlying goal of the book is to make you <laughs> maybe not squish the bug that yeah. you see in your house <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and I'm one like you must have done a lot of research into butterflies and insects and people who do that for a job um just wondering if there's something that you can share that you found with your research that really surprised you yeah, 
absolutely. Um, one really cool thing I got to do and that a lot of writers get to do is talk to experts mm. when you're doing research. So I got to talk to several entomologists who, you know, do this day in and day out. And one of the most interesting ones that I talked to studies wasps for a living. Oh, okay. And so she, she's gotten stung, you know, mm. thousands of times mm. by wasps. Um, and it was really interesting to hear her describe how some wasps are a little bit more cowardly than others and some wasps, you know, they'll sting you once and some will chase you. Um, mm. I also, one thing I didn't know is that male wasps don't sting. Oh, really? And so she has all these that. videos of herself yeah. with these male wasps just kind of pretending to sting her hanging mm. out on her hand and they're not really doing anything. Mm. But a big takeaway that I learned um, in all of my discussions with entomologists is that they refer to insects as animals which of course they are, but I never really considered that before. You know, I, of course I love puppies mm. and kitties mm. and, you know, birds, but to hear <laughs> insects referred to as animals made me think about them differently and mm. give them just a little bit more like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, insects can be cute and they can be, you know, <laughs> there's all kinds of things about them that are interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got a few people watching now, which is great. Just um, reminding people if they want to ask Rachel a question, please type yeah. it in comments and I can read it out. Um, I do have a question from Jill. So Jill wonders about your cover. She said your cover is fabulous. Do you want to show it again? Yeah. It's yeah. Really thank you. Bright and stands out. And she wonders if you chose that or had anything to do with the final. Oh, it's result. a funny story. My publisher chose that mainly. Mm. Um, I had a little bit of input. So they, they really wanted a bright cover. I think especially since the book came out in late 2020, they knew everyone was just kind of fried and they don't really mm. want something grumpy looking, mm. especially when you have a grumpy main character, you want to soften <laughs> it in some ways. Um, so the cover looks a lot like a rom-com and it does have mm. rom romance elements in it, but that's definitely not the most of the book. Mm. So sometimes people are a little surprised. They're like, oh, interesting. That was one element, but not the only thing. The one thing I did make sure of is I'll, I'll put it up a little closer. So my main character is, this one right here. And you can see she's wearing boots. Mm. Um, in the original draft, they had her in heels. Oh. And I was like, she would <laughs> heels and a butterfly net. That's <laughs> not her at all. So I had to change that. <laughs> yeah that's funny but I, yeah. I did love i love how bright it is yeah it is very nice and bright and i'm wondering about how you became to be a writer is it something you'd always mm. wanted to do and maybe like what have you had another career before you became writing yeah so i always wanted to be a writer since i was a little kid mm. um i wrote my first book when i was 10 years old in a notebook, you know, mm. 100 pages of a summer camp story. Mm. Um, so I always knew that was something I wanted to do. But I also, um, I work at a university as well, mm. at the university that I mentioned in my book. And I don't uh, write for that job necessarily. I do some teaching and some supervision. Um, so it's nice to have sort of the two parts of my life. Um, yeah. And then I'm also a mom. So I have three little kids. So it's kind of lots of forces butting yeah. up against each other all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what do you teach at university? Is yeah, so I used to teach public speaking. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so public that... speaking and, and business cl classes. So okay. getting future business people ready, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was when I was writing the book, that's what I was doing all the time. Mm. So how do you find time for your writing? Do you have to make sure you set aside set an amount of time or what do you do for that? That's a great question. I try to hit a, a word count goal. Mm. So, you know, when I'm in the middle of a project, I try to get about even just 500 words a day, you know, about a page and a half can really make a big difference in, in making progress for a project. Mm. Um, right now I'm sort of between books because I just finished something last month. But when I'm in the middle of writing something, I often am such a grumpy person that if I'm not writing, I'm really hard to be around. So it's better for my family <laughs> and my coworkers if I do set aside an hour at night or sometimes right before yeah. I go to work um, to do some writing just for all yeah. of our sakes. Yeah. And Jill and Belinda are both asked about what you have in the pipeline. And you just oh yeah you just finished yeah that. I have yeah. um I have two finished projects one of them is 
a book set in 19, the 1990s. And um, it hasn't gone out to publishers yet. It's just finished um, earlier this year. And it's um, about two women who find out that they've been uh, married to the same man for the course of their lives. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> um, that sounds so, interesting. <laughs> so it's uh, sort of about their, it's not really so much about the man. Mm. Um, it's more about just how their lives change over the course of the, a summer. Mm. Um, and then the other one I just finished a few weeks ago is is a real romantic comedy. And it was so much fun to write, especially just as a mental break to, to write two people falling in love and arguing and just mm. banter. So two different types of projects yeah. and I'm hoping they'll have home soon. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to read them sometime maybe next year. Um, Kelly's wondering, well, sorry, Kelly said your book has been compared to the popular Rosie project. Mm -hmm. And um, she wonders if similar to the Rosie project, do you think you might have any sequels? Oh, I wish. <laughs> Although it's funny, I think that some of my readers ha probably have better ideas about what would happen in sequels than I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I saw a librarian friend of mine yesterday. She's like, I can't stop thinking about the characters and, and thinking about what they would be doing. And I'm like, tell me, what, what are they doing? <laughs> I'd love to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Jill wonders what you like to read, if you've got a favorite genre. And I'm wondering if there's anything you might have been re reading lately that you'd like to recommend to us. Oh, absolutely. I love to read. Mm. I actually, um, I have a book recommendation podcast with some okay. friends. And we do like a game show where we recommend books to people. It's called Blind Date with a Book. It's so fun. You'll um, have to share so I that. Read... You'll have to share yeah, that I'll again share it out. Yeah. The group. yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. We use dating app questions to set people oh. up with books. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so I try to read about 150 books a year. And I like all kinds of books. I love thrillers. Mm. I love literary fiction and historical fiction and romance. Um, the only thing I'm kind of a chicken about is horror. You know, mm. I, if it's too bloody, I, I kind of turn away a little yeah. bit. <laughs> um, but a couple books that I loved recently, I, I finished um, Great Circle last week by Maggie Shipstead. And it's about a female pilot in the 1920s. And then there's a parallel plot line of uh, a contemporary woman who's playing her in a movie. Okay. And so it's, it's like a nice dual timeline book that's mm. just beautifully written. Um, I really enjoyed, um, I was talking before this that I, I was able to get an early copy of the new Leanne Moriarty and I really enjoyed that. It was nice. I think I finished it in like a day and a half. Yeah. I just couldn't sort of stop. Some of those yeah. books are just so easy to devour. Um, what else have I loved lately? Oh, and then the Firekeeper's Daughter, if you like, um, young adult literature is, um, an indigenous indigenous teenager figuring out um, sort of a mystery in her community and okay. what's happened and it's really great. Yeah, no, thanks for those. They sound like some good recommendations. Um, Jill wonders if you pay attention to your reviews. I don't. <laughs> I just, um, you know, I think that once a book is out in the world it's for readers. Yeah. So unless someone, you know, reaches out specifically and sends me an email or comments on, on something, um, like comments on my Twitter or something, I don't go and search for that because I really do think places like Goodreads are for other readers. Yeah. And that's how I interact with them too, when I'm a reader. So yeah. I would feel like horrible to, to know if I was offending someone with my thoughts as a mm. reviewer too. Mm. And I'm wondering how, like, this is your first novel you've had published. How mm -hmm. um, hard or easy was it for you to get that first one published? Oh, man, it's been kind of a journey. Yeah. So this is the third book I wrote, mm -hmm. um, and then the first one that got published. So the first book I ever wrote was horrible. It will, <laughs> it will never uh, see the light mm -hmm. of day, but it taught me how to write a book, which was important. Um, the second book I ever wrote, I was able to find an agent for, and agents are the people who um, introduce your book to publishing houses. So yeah. if you want to be published and be able to go to a place like HarperCollins or, or Macmillan or mm -hmm. one of those types of places, you need an, an agent to be a representative. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, that book didn't sell when it got sent around to publishers. Nobody wanted to pick it up. 
-hmm. So during the time when that book was going on what's called submission and, and trying to see if an editor wanted it, I wrote what became the butterfly effect. Yeah. Um, so I sent that to my agent at the time. I said, here's, here's the book I'm sure will sell. I love this book. I love this mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. And she said, ah, I don't like it. <laughs> and and the, the big critique she had, which was very fair, is that originally um, I wrote The Butterfly Effect in three perspectives. Okay. So I wrote it in Greta, my main character, who's very grumpy in her mm. perspective, mm. Um, in the perspective of her brother who has the aneurysm, as well as in the perspective of um, his fiance. So those are all the most important sort of players in the book. Mm. And she said, you need to tell it just from Greta's perspective. And I said, what? But then what about the love story uh, between the brother and the fiance? And sort of how they come to, you know, trust each other and see who each other are after all of this. And she's like, no, but it's not really their story. Mm -hmm. So I got to, I spent about 18 months rewriting the butterfly effect just from Greta's perspective, which was a really fun challenge because still a lot of the book is telling the love story of these other two people, yeah. Greta and, Dan or Meg and Danny. Um, and you're really rooting for them, but Greta isn't. Mm -hmm. um, so you as a, as a reader should be following along their story and really wanting them to get back together or to stay together. Mm -hmm. And Greta's like, they should never be together. I hate Meg, <laughs> Like mm -hmm. she's never good enough for him. Um, so it's really fun to play against how you know the reader is gonna be reading the book versus how you are writing it to be in the head of the character. So it was really fun to do that. Yeah. Um, and then eventually we were able to, um, send it out to editors and somebody loved it. So I found my right partner and yeah, yeah the rest is history. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so from when you first started with your first book to when you knew that a publisher was taking the butterfly effect, how long did that take? Oh, wow. Let's see here. I think it was six years. Okay, yeah, so a little while. Six years. Mm. So did, yeah, you, and I, did you have someone who really encouraged you through that time? You know, I think I had a lot of people who encouraged me. My family has always been very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of um, people who are, are parents as well as writers, and it can be very hard to find the balance between having small children and writing, but also it can really help you focus um, because you don't have a lot of time of the day that is yours, your free time. And so when you do have that time, you sit down and take advantage of it. And so I didn't even start writing novels until I had a baby. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't use my time very wisely until I had had my first child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so my writing career and my mother, my motherhood have really gone like in tandem, which is really funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard a lot of authors say that that um, when they have less time, they seem to be a lot more productive than when they have lots of time to write. Yeah, absolutely. Your brain just works differently when you're expected to be doing non-writing stuff. It's yeah. just the only time your brain really wants to write. <laughs> And I'm wondering about the characters in your book. Are they based on anyone that you'd met or heard about? So I'd say they're all a mix. Um, so nobody is a direct relationship, but yeah. part of the central themes of the book um, come from my own life. So mm -hmm. when I was a child, I was um, eight years old and my brother um, got cancer and he passed away. Mm -hmm. And so I've been thinking about these relationships of sibling caretaking since I was a little kid. You know, when you're eight, there's not much you can do to help your sibling as they're going through a crisis. But um, as I got older and started to think about what might make a good novel, I started to think about, well, what if someone were put into a caretaking role for their sibling at a time in life when you wouldn't expect it? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're in your late 20s or early 30s, you don't expect to be put into the caretaking role for someone else who's in that same time of life. So I thought that would be interesting to see how siblings could support each other at that time, yeah. since I didn't have a chance to do that. Yeah, no, that's really interesting, yeah. And um, when you started writing, did you know how your book was going to end? Not really. Um, I started this book as an, a National Novel Writing Month project. Okay. And so I wrote, you know, 1,600 words a day mm. just to do it. And you can't really overthink things too much when you're trying to draft something quickly. So the first draft came pretty quickly and I had some rough ideas of where I was heading for the first third of the book. Um, and then from then on, my characters just took over and sort of went in their own directions. Mm -hmm. That meant I had to do 
a lot of editing later <laughs> and a lot of um, removing of scenes and of course taking away the other two perspectives yeah. but um, the first draft definitely didn't have that kind of structure that I've come to to use for other books that I've been working on. Yeah. And you mentioned before that you have a couple of unpublished books. Do you think you'd ever go back to try and fix them up or change them a bit? I don't know. Well, the first one, probably not. Yeah. Uh, first one, I think, is, is better laid to rest. My second one, um, maybe. Maybe we'll see if the time is right. Um, mm. But I love the projects that I've got going on as well. And yeah. so it's kind of like, I would never want to shove uh, my new projects out of the way for that. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. And could you tell us what you hope readers will love about your book? Yeah, I hope that readers love humor. Um, one thing I really love in books and that I love to write as a novelist is funny characters, even when the situation is not so funny. Um, because I think all of us, even when we're going through times of great stress, sometimes you can't help but seeing the absurd in a situation or something that just makes you stop and say, well, that's kind of weird. Mm. Um, that makes me laugh. And I think that being able to find something funny, even in weird or uncomfortable situations, is, is just a real goal of mine. Yeah, yeah. And how did you find promoting oh. your, like your book came out, was it late last year? December, yeah, yeah, in December of so last how year. How did you find what sort of things were you able to do to promote your book? I know, like, well, with there being lockdowns in some places, and yeah, and yeah, then. it was so strange to not be able to do, you know, in store events or anything like mm -hmm. that. But um, it was so wonderful to be able to do these online ki kind of forums and be able to talk to people. Um, one opportunity that I got that I wouldn't have had otherwise was to be able to talk to some of my author friends who live in different places all over the world. Yeah. Um, my, uh, one of my friends, um, Jessie Sutanto, her book, Dial A for Aunties, we were able to have a discussion and she lives in Asia. You know, okay. we would never have been able to have time together yeah. to meet in a bookstore, um, but we were able to have a Zoom chat. So it's, it's really cool. Mm, no, I just recently read that book as well. Oh, I love, yeah. I love, I love her and I love mm. uh, the book. I can't wait for the sequel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she's hilarious. Yeah. And um, Kelly said that you're right, the world needs funny characters. She said, do you have one that left an impression with you from the book? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, I'd say I really, I really did enjoy writing my main character because she's so different than me. She's such um she's such a jerk <laughs> actually in the first like three quarters of the book and it's so freeing to write a character who truly doesn't feel like they have to be nice to anyone who just will say exactly what they're thinking and mm. will process things that way it's really nice to have that kind of outlet even though that's mm. not how I work <laughs> um but other than that I would say it was really fun to write um write her brother as well because he has synesthesia so when he hears music he sees colors um and so beyond being able to research insects for this book i researched a lot about synesthesia and i researched a lot about um classical music okay. especially so yeah so it was something you'd heard about before how did you come about i read that? i read about it in um sax his, his last name is sax he's a he was a psychologist he, okay. he passed away a few years ago but mm. um I, I, when I read that a few years ago, I was like, this is fascinating. Yeah. I think the book was called Musicophilia. And it was all about what kinds of um, like child prodigies in music and music related mm. brain conditions and all mm. kinds of things. Mm. So that definitely, I think writers just sort of soak stuff up until it's the right time to, yeah, to use yeah, it. And that was yeah. one of those things. Mm. And if you could give any aspiring authors a tip, what would you tell them? don't don't give up on yourself um mm -hmm. even if your project isn't the book that people are going to see just yet keep writing because every book even the ones that you don't have published teach you lessons about your work mm -hmm. and yourself and it's it's worth doing them even when no one else gets to read it except you you got to mm -hmm. read it and it was the book you needed to write at the time yeah. that's what i would say yeah thanks for that and thanks so much for joining us. It's been great talking to you and I look Thank forward you. to seeing more of your books. Just wondering if you want to let people know watching um, how they can keep in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. You can find me on Facebook at Rachel Nance McKenney Writer.
just all one word. I'm also on Twitter at RM McKenney, M C K E N N Y. And if you have the new book club, uh, I, I'm also Instagram, Rachel Mans McKenney. And there's also a new um, social media platform called Book Club. Have you heard about this one? No, um, no. I just got an author page on there, and it's okay. a place where you can do discussion guides and um, chat with other people who are reading the same book that you are. Yeah, okay. That sounds interesting as well. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, and thanks everyone who joined in, and we had some great questions, which was great. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day or night, whatever time it is where you are. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.